social policy. Social policy is different for different things. You know, it's keep changing. Also, we, we you know, try and understand that. It was in uh, a kind of reformist in 1940s, 50s. The moment, you know, the world war is over, the British, you know, they came up with this idea that, you know, we have to really do something for, for people, for citizens. So it was a very reformist kind of, you know, ideology, you know. Uh, Titmus and Beveridge report we have seen. Then it's changed a little bit in uh, 80s, maybe because, you know, the new right critique, you know, people have started saying that uh, welfare state, you know, extend, I mean, extends dependency, it, it will uh, enhance, uh, it's a lot of burden on people who pay, you know, taxes, it's a, it's a burden on the state, you know, all this kind of criticism. And now people are talking about something mixed economies, you know, what kind of welfare state in the 21st century? So we saw that. So there are a lot of uh, interesting ideas in the first week. And then, why should we have social policy? Again, it gives fairness and it ensures social peace, improve economy. A lot of books written on that. Who conducts social policy analysis? You and me and others. Why do I undertake comparative study social policy? Because why do we need comparison? I think comparison actually came very late. I mean, uh, now 21st century, the most, uh, the, the most happening thing that's happening in social policy is people started comparing so that they can learn better. They can learn from other experiences. When they compare, they can also understand their own limitations. So I think comparison is another, I think, new trend that we see in social policy studies or analysis. So that's what I think your course is all about, comparative policy uh, 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 analysis in Asia. So why compare? We again come back to this. How do we compare? Again, we'll cover this in few weeks. So week two, last week, we tried to understood what are the concepts of welfare, how do we define welfare state, and how do we classify welfare state. So I build on that this week. So basically, maybe at the end of now, this week, you should be able to understand concepts of welfare. You know, I think we have done last time. Again, we'll do a little bit today. And why welfare state? Have we done that? Have we done that? Why, why do we need a welfare state? Can't we live without that? Are there any, you know, countries or any, any, any nations without such arrangement? Because anyway, they're changing. So why do we need them? Why do they persist? How do they exist? You know, what kind of welfare regimes that we have studied? You know, how do we study them in a in, in, in little bit more in detail? So these are some of the questions I think naturally comes to our mind. Okay, this is welfare state, fine. It is uh, it's supposed to give uh, equality of you know, opportunities and equitable distribution and all that's fine. But how are they existing? Why are they existing? You know, how do they persist? You know? So what might be the, uh, the, the arguments behind these, these questions? Any ideas on this? Why do you think welfare states persist or exist even now in 21st century where market plays an important role? You and me know that you know, our lives are driven by markets, demand and supply. But we are still believing in this very concept called welfare states. Why? What is the magic? Okay, high economic development. They have a lot of budgets for welfare or welfare provisions. Not okay. They remain. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What could be other arguments? Any other arguments? As long as uh, human beings uh, or citizens around, the states will be there. As long as the states, politicians will be there. They will have some uh, welfare provisions because they want to re-win or re-elect. Is that or something else driving, you know, this concept to be alive in that way? Though it's been changing. 50s, we have some, seen something. And so six, 80s, maybe the state is withdrawing, the market is playing more role. Maybe 90s or 2000 or, you know, now it's both state and market. Maybe after 10 years, it's only state or maybe, we don't know. You know, there are all these trends that are happening and we are able to see these, you know, uh, in the literature. We'll, some of these things we will try and understand today. 
Yeah, I agree with Amri, but maybe uh, there are other, you know, arguments that we could see. What happens when you read, you know, such statements? I work hard so that people on welfare don't have to work hard or don't have to. Hmm? Even Abraham Lincoln, it seems, I've taken it from the website. You can't help men permanently by doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. Yeah, he also believes in welfare state, of course. When we read this kind of statement, what comes to us? Is it a criticism or is it uh, the fact or is it the, you know, popular notions that actually, you know, influences the very structure of welfare state or very argument against the welfare state? What, what, what kind of things that comes to my mind? I work hard so that people on welfare, you know, government's help, government dole or whatever you call it, government assistance, you know, they don't have to. Is it, what kind of statement is that? And you see a male, you know, breadwinner there. You now, why is that there is a male breadwinner? Why is that there is no uh, female, you know? She's saying, you know, I work hard so that my husband, you know, uh, 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 don't have to, or my children don't have to. We don't have that. What is the connection between gender and welfare state? That is another, you know, area now people are questioning. You know, when we see the welfare state, it's most of the welfare state idea, it seems depend on a male breadwinner and his or her, you know, capacities to earn and feed the family. But that's changing now. Now there are career, dual career families. If you look at, you know, UK, US, Malaysia, they're all working, you know, contributing to the family movie. Maybe the women is more, you know, uh, um, uh, economically independent now and contributing to the family more than in the past. So why are we still, you know, having these kind of uh, pictures or, you know, ideas? What do you think about this? Though I have taken from the U.S. point of view, because U.S. is supposed to be a liberal welfare state, where a residual, you know, uh, uh, social policy is in existence. When we say residual, the state only come into picture only when the family and, you know, market fails. That's what we have studied, right? In a residual welfare, only the state will come into picture when your family and the market is a failure. You don't have any other option, but the state has to come into picture. If U.S. is that example for that kind of thing, this is what it seems that Ronald Reagan, you know, said. Welfare's purpose should be to eliminate, as far as possible, the need for its own existence. Very interesting statement, huh? So what is he saying? There should not be any welfare. People should be self-dependent. It should teach people, make them independent. Interesting. I wish there's no doctor. Doctor, uh, doctor saying that, I wish there's no diseases in the world, you know, so that they don't need to come to me. Very interesting. As a social worker, I would say that, I wish, you know, there are no uh, human problems, so that the very, you know, role for social worker doesn't exist. But will that happen? It's a good wish, you know. It's a very ideological, very, you know, ideal. But is that happens? This is what he says. Welfare's purpose should be to eliminate, as far as possible, the need for its own existence. So that, you know, people, you know, on their own, they don't really depend on each other or especially state, market, family, or whatever. So that there's no need for a welfare department. People can take care of themselves. Very interesting. We should measure welfare success or well, department of welfare or social welfare policies success. How? by how many people leave welfare, not by how many are added. Basically, he's also talking about the dependence rates, you know. The, the critique of social welfare or social policy is that it makes people lazy, it makes people more dependent on the state or state assistance. So he says that the very success of the welfare or welfare policies or social policy is not how many people are added, but how many people are leaving the welfare system so that, you know, they are now self-sufficient or they can manage on their own, they can feed for themselves, they can feed their own children, they're not dependent, you know, basically. So what do you think about this? Maybe one more. Hmm? Now, you know, the, 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 the Clinton era, you know, the Reagan, the Bush, the Clinton, in each uh, era you can see a particular, you know, uh, uh, impact of their leadership, 
uh, on these social policies. I think it was the signing of welfare reform in 1996. Unprecedented success. A Washington Post, you know, saying on 98, 10, on 8th of, you know, 8th. So what, what does that mean? More, less funds, more cuts. What is this welfare reform all about? Who is going to be benefited? Why there was a re, uh, need for a reform at all? If a welfare is, has to be there, it will have to be there, it will be there, then what is this reform all about? Why, why do people, you know, uh, uh, basically want it to be on welfare list? I don't think anyone would allow to be there if, if they can support on their own. Then you see, you know, a more recent uh, uh, theory or literature or, you know, discourse on welfare to work. It's not welfare, it's workfare, you know. You work and you get paid. You, the state creates working opportunities rather than giving you, you know, the assistance. Welfare to work, you know. You can see that Republican Party, you know, a greeting card, a very satiric, you know, card. Because welfare is not an option, occupation, you know, you cannot, you know, just live on welfare. It, it, it will become your occupation, you know. It is not a, an occupation, so you have to get out of that one day, very soon, a, as soon as possible, you know. So what kind of ideas, you know, these, these, uh, these uh, pictures, uh, visuals tell us? What are they telling us? Of course, all of them uh, have taken from US kind of thing. But we can apply this to the, to the Malaysian context also, I'm sure. You know, Malaysia also may be, you know, cutting a lot of welfare. You know, I think Najib said it is um, a welfare state, but a welfare state in a different kind, you know. Huh? Productive. productive welfare. What does that mean, you know? What do we mean by productivist approach or productive welfare? So welfare only for people who produce or able to produce or capable of producing. What about others then? Actually, the whole welfare started people who can't produce. They need your help. That's why, you know, the welfare came in too, right? If people can produce, so what kind of welfare are we talking about? By the way, welfare is only for poor people or for all of us. Till now, what is our understanding? Is welfare only for poor people or for all of us? Depends on which model, okay. What is your model? What do you think? For all? Sorry? For all or only for poor people who are struggling? Who can't. Who can't. Only if people who can't, okay? Uh, so there are other people who can do everything on their own. For example, uh, I'm very rich, I, I, I'm earning 10,000 ringgits, but can I live on my own without any you know, state support, security, or, or maybe something else, you know? Uh, risks, you know, I'm, I'm disasters. I'm 10,000 earning, but tomorrow I got an accident, and from the next month, I'm, I'm, I lost my job, and that's it, I need support. I haven't had any savings. So it is only for poor people or it's for everyone, because risks are, you know, there for everyone. So I think these are the things that actually influences, again, the very classification of welfare state or arguments for or against the welfare state. And that means in the social policy in that way. Yeah, there is a book here by Andrew Dolan, it seems, which helps people how to get access to all this. See, how to get food stamps, how to get welfare and other benefits. Of course, for US citizens, again, mostly, you know, maybe uh, focused on immigrants, maybe, or people who need assistance. It seems many of them even don't know how to apply, how to access this, these welfare assistance. You can see that. A study showed that 40 million unemployed and underemployed currently receive food stamps so that you can get food or buy food or whatever. The study also estimated that another 20 million people fail to apply because they either don't know that they are eligible or they don't know how to you know, apply. So that this book helps them to apply. What does that mean? Why, why, why do we need uh, you know, these kind of books? What is the relevance of these books? Do you think this, this should be there or this kind of, you know, literature should not be available, people can find themselves. Look at that, food stamps, 
heating bills assistance, subsidized phone service, subsidized housing, subsidized child care, housing for homeless, veterans, the school lunch program, unemployment insurance. You can go on like that. I think there are about 40, 50 kind of, you know, assistance program that you can see uh, 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 in a state like, you know, U.S., which is a very residual state. One side, you're saying that welfare is, should not exist in first place. The very success of welfare is not by adding the numbers, but how many people we are or we are able to, you know, help them to go out of the welfare. Another side, you have all these programs and, you know, all this kind of literature helping them to access those. What is this contradiction? That's what I'm just trying to understand. What do you think? Japan, what is happening there? All these programs, you see that or it's not? They are not available. There's no poverty. Hmm? Malaysia, there are no homeless people here. No poverty. Only one person, three person, I don't know how much. Hmm? So, I think this makes us to think welfare state is relevant still or, you know, it has to exist. It will exist whether you like it or not. You know, I, I remember I asked this question, how does, you know, welfare states persist or exist? Why do they exist? As long as the human needs are not met. As long as you recognize the needs as part of, you remember that slide, the, the discussion, the, 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 the institutional welfare, recognize need as a you know, part of human, you know, welfare. Whether you're rich or poor doesn't matter. You will have, you know, a certain unfulfilled needs and you need help, you know, to fulfill them. So, some of these uh, arguments for welfare that you can see it is a humanitarian, you know. It's, there is no other way, you know. It's very humanitarian. There are, you know, risks. There are, you know, un unforeseen uh, uh, situations that everyone needs help. So it's a very humanitarian to have a welfare system in a particular state or in a particular country. It is also religious, it seems. Welfare, you know, connected to religious, religious needs, religious uh, practices. Jakar, for example, in Malaysia or in Muslim, you know, uh, countries. Major religions make charity or religious duty and solidarity, solidarity, networks. You know, any religion also talks about uh, these solidarity and uh, helping the, you know, poor. It's also mutual self-interest. Many welfare systems have developed not from the state activity alone, but from a combination of mutualist activities. What is this mutual self-interest, for example? You are in an apartment, you are in a neighborhood. What, you have your own rules. How to, you know, uh, what kind of security you should have, how much monthly, you know, uh, maintenance elements, what are the rights, you know, what are the duties, who should be allowed, who should not be allowed. You know, you have your own, you know, security there, you know, for 100 families, 50 families, you know. So that is, to me, a mutual self-interest. Because you all wanted to live together, irrespective of your class, caste, religion, gender, whatever, there is a mutual self-interest. Because we all want to live in that place, you know, uh, with an harmony, with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, respect, or whatever. So you can also, you know, come up with some welfare activities, maybe, uh, as, a, as a, a, a residential neighborhood or a apartment association, whatever you call it. So there are many reasons why welfare should exist or welfare policy should exist in a particular community or in a particular state. It's also democratic. There are people who claim that uh, as long as there are welfare, that it, is, it, is, it creates a democratic society because of fairness, you know, we discussed. It, 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 it allows you, you know, social policies brings fairness, you know, by equality of opportunities and by creating equitable uh, uh, resource distributions. So it is democratic. It also, you know, triggers democratic rights. It grows a welfare state or a good, well, a robust welfare state needs a particular democratic system where rights, you know, have been agreed, respected, protected. It's also very practical, you know. Welfare provisions has an economic and social benefits. 
countries with more extensive systems of social protection tend to be richer and have less poverty. A recent a sociologist from US visiting uh, UK also said the same thing, has a book also, I'll show you that slide. It's very practical to have these welfare provisions in a particular country because it's both social and economic gains. It also, you know, uh, evidence shows that countries with more extensive systems of social protection tend to be richer, though they they'll be spending more on the welfare, you know, and have less poverty levels. But there are people who also said, no, no, that's fine, but it also violates a human freedom. You know, I don't want to pay, you know, for others who can't, you know, pay for themselves. It's my right. I'm earning, I, I let me have all the, you know, uh, 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 freedom to uh, spend my own money. Violates, it's people's freedom. For some people, redistribution is a theft. You're taking from me without my will, wish, and you're giving it to someone else. You know, so it's like, a, you know, you're, as if you're stealing, you know, my rights or my money, my wealth, and you're redistributing it. Some people uh, see a redistribution as a threat or a theft. Taxation is a forced labor. You know, you're taxing me, I'm working hard, I'm earning, and you're putting me on all kinds of taxes and making me more and more work. It's a forced labor. People have absolute rights to use their own property, their own wealth, as their own wish, you know? So you should respect that. So for few people, you know, argue like this. What do you think? Where you are? Do you think it's just they're arguing for the sake of arguing? There is, a, there is a meat in that. There is a truth in that. What do you think? It violates people's freedom. Hmm? I don't like redistribution. I work hard. I study hard. I invested a lot of money into my education. Now I'm earning. Why you want to redistribute? What happens if you don't redistribute? For example, maybe a few people will die, so what? As long as we as a country are producing, you know? It's better to have 100 people are working rather than 300 people not working. Hmm? Is that what they, want, what they mean? Redistribution is theft. I don't like redistribution. What do you think? These arguments, they're valid? To, maybe this is easy to understand, maybe, you know, it's democratic. Yes, it's very democratic, we can see that, because there's a redistribution of, you know, resources. You know, I'm disabled, I'm, I'm, but I'm also equally participate because other people are helping me. It's a humanity, yes, you know, it's there in the religion, it's there in the, you know, uh, our culture, practices. But this is a little difficult to, you know, understand, you know. There are people who are saying this. What do you think? I think we need to understand both sides. Hmm? If this is not correct, then, then there's no, you know, problem about welfare states. We, we don't need to really worry a lot. Because we believe that they should exist, they will exist. Welfare is a need, it's, a, it's religion, it's humanity, it's uh, all that. Hmm? What do you think about this criticism? But why should we reduce the social gap? Why? I'm earning, I'm happy. So why, why the... And I actually maintain, you know, I want to maintain the social gap. That's why I work hard. Otherwise, you are also rich, I'm also rich. What is the fun of being rich then? You are rich, I'm poor, then only, you know? I agree your point, you know, redistribution reduces the gap. Huh? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, although I think taxation, I, I will not agree taxation is for labor, I think taxation is for services that you receive from the state. So, where, state, where taxation is usually higher in certain states, you get better services from the states. So, that I, I, I would probably disagree. But talking about violating people's freedom of choice, uh, I think, yeah, that's. There's a point. Whereas taxation is forced labor, maybe it's an exaggeration a little bit, but you know, I'm using the same road, I'm using the same, you know, same uh, whatever, you know, facilities, but why are you taxing me high? You know, because I, just because I'm little, earning a little bit more, you take my 40%, whereas you are only taking 10% of his salary. 
But whereas you are taking 40% of my salary because I am earning 20,000 ringgits. So why are you taking more from me? I am using the same road, I am using the same, uh, you know, uh, maybe a uh, water facility or whatever. It's the same security that you are giving me. You are not giving me any special, you know, security putting, you know, a lot of people around me. You are taking more from me for the same services. I think that's what, you know, they mean. People who are paying higher taxes, they are saying this naturally. Mm -hmm. and, and in some ways, this is a question, I think it's like a paradox within democracy. You want to let people have a voice, but when people say something that other people don't like, they feel like they don't believe. Uh -huh. So you're saying that uh, people who believe or who are against the welfare, they don't believe in democracy itself? No, I say they, they do. They do, they but do. then? That's the problem with democracy. I think. Uh -huh. uh, they do believe in democracy, but they don't ex you know, accept these things. Yeah, Interesting. Okay, so there are people who are saying, you know, uh, positive about welfare. They're saying that it should, you know, exist. It has to be exist because it is a humanity. It is also part of religion. It's part of our culture. It creates social harmony. It creates social peace. But there are also people who are saying that no, it is a human right violation. It is a heavy taxation. This and that. But what is this welfare all about then? You know, is this or is something else? If we have the same common definition for welfare, then maybe we are seeing both sides of the same coin. So the, at least this definition says, welfare is often associated with needs. That's correct, right? I think the whole social policy, welfare state, we are talking about needs or how we look at needs as a universal or it is a selective, you know? Welfare is often associated with needs. If there is no need, there is no need for welfare. Because you have needs, I have needs, you have needs, different kinds of needs, of course. But then we have needs. But it goes beyond the people's needs. To achieve well being, people must have choices and the scope to choose personal goals and ambitions. What is this? Welfare is often associated with needs, but it goes beyond that, you know, uh, a discussion, right? Welfare is all about to achieve well-being. What we mean by well-being is people must have choices and the scope to choose personal goals and ambitions. If that is the welfare, then why people are against this welfare? Somewhere problem with this, you know, definition must be. Right? What is the problem with this definition? There's no problem with this definition, right? Welfare is often associated with human needs. But it should also go beyond that. Go beyond means we should talk about welfare means it's not just needs, but it's also well-being. How do we well-being? What do we mean by well-being? You have your own choices. You have a lot of scope to choose your own goals and your own ambitions. That's all. So basically welfare is helping you to fulfill your own ambitions and your own goals, your own little you know, needs, your own little aspirations in your life. That's all. So why people are, you know, uh, anti-welfare or uh, against welfare. There must be something, you know, more than this. There must be something, you know, beyond this, which welfare is doing. That's why they're very, you know, very uh, uh, vocal or very critical. Is this welfare or is more than that? What is our understanding of welfare? This is one uh, definition of welfare. How do we understand welfare? Welfare in Malay is what? JK, ah, Kabang San. Kabaji Khan. What is Kabaji Khan? When we look into our own you know, term, what is Kabaji Khan? Needs, well being, ambitions, aspirations, or it's more than that. Maybe, you know, our very understanding about welfare is very different. Maybe for them, welfare is something that promote to earn more. Welfare is something helps them to decide on their own without any market interventions. Welfare is something that uh, uh, gives the absolute rights. Is that they see welfare? People who are arguing against. I think if we can understand their viewpoints, I think we'll be able to understand 
welfare, welfare state, social policy much better. What do you think? What if you are, you know, believing in that? For example, I believe in this. Then what should be my definition about welfare? Welfare is all about needs, but not well-being. Just basic minimum needs. That's it. Don't talk more than that. Because anyway, you're not earning. You can't even expect, you know, well-being because you're not earning. You're lazy. You, you, you are poor. You, you, you are less ca you know, capable. How can you talk about well-being? Maybe for them, it is only just needs, that basic needs. And not all this, having your own choices, ambitions, goals, this is all, you know, far beyond for you. For you, welfare is just basic needs. But whereas people who are talking about pro or for welfare, for them it's not just needs, it's going beyond the needs argument. It's well-being. What is well-being? Making your own choices, making your own aspirations, making your own goals, making, meeting your own ambitions. Is that, is the thin line between this or it's something else? Otherwise people, why should people, you know, uh, say anti-welfare? If they're not affected by that, okay, welfare is all this for you, okay, I don't care. But I don't believe in this. Okay. It's, it's very subjective. Mm -hmm. It depends on society, society. Mm -hmm. but, but needs is always quite, quite, uh, quite similar. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah, for, for but even comforts, I think people will agree to some, some extent what is comfortable and what is not comfortable. But I think in like, for example, a comfortable means of life. In Malaysia, it is 4,000 you know, ringgits per month. People will agree on that. Don't you think? Maybe for some it's still not comfortable, but still I think to a large extent people will have some common ideas of what is quality of life, you know, what is comfortable life at least. So what I was trying to understand how people see welfare, you know, the very different way of looking at welfare, maybe, you know, having implications on the way we look at welfare state, welfare policies. If we all look at welfare in the same way, it's religious, it's humanity, it's our responsibility. If we look at welfare in that, those lines, then I think there should be one, you know, all of us should be agreeing to this. So the, the very welfare, the discourse on welfare, the discussion on welfare, what is welfare, I think it's a very heated in a way, you know. We don't have a common agreement on that, we'll see that. There are again there are a lot of sources of welfare, you know, this is where I think the welfare state, the institutions and residual, for example. You need a break, tell me, okay? It's a little, what do you call, hard or, you know, it makes us to think in the afternoon, but I think it's very important. So what we have done till now is trying to understand welfare in a little more critical, detailed or whatever view. Have we ever thought about that? Have we ever thought about welfare? Now, what is welfare? What is welfare means to you and what is welfare means to me? Maybe there are gender preferences. There are, you know, life stage preferences. When I was a kid, welfare to me is something different when I became a father. Or when I become old, welfare, me, welfare to me means something else. Maybe it also changes with the age, changes with the, you know, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the context. That's why I think still it is a very interesting Subject, there are different sources of welfare one can tap into. There are public sector, the state, there are private foundations, charities, NGOs, there are voluntary organizations, civil society, church, religion, mutual aid, informal. There's so many sources that we can tap, you know, welfare into. What else? Any other sources that you can think of? Maybe large coalitions, advocate, you know, advocacy networks. I mean, you name anything, I think we can get something out of that. Institutions, universities. Do you think universities are not part of our welfare? Student welfare. You know, there is a D, vice chancellor for that. What does that mean? Industries, they're not part of our welfare. Of course, they look after your welfare, your health, occupational health, your mobility, your promotions, your incentives, your skills. You name any sector, I think that welfare component is there. Health, there's no welfare. 
It's very direct, you know, we can see that. Which defends the welfare of the, of the, of the, of the military, the welfare of the, you know, uh, combatants or what you call, the soldiers. Where, where, where is that we don't see a place for welfare? Malls, recreation places, or what do you, Queen's Bay or whatever. What kind of welfare mechanism that you see there? It's supposed to be a very market-driven place, right? You have a buy and sell. You do see any welfare there? Those kind of, you know, places? What is that lift, you know? What is that uh, disaster, you know, way out, you know? There are some signals, this and that, you know, maybe some provisions for uh, free water, or, you know, free uh, bathrooms. Or, you see that? So where is that we, we don't see any place for welfare? It is everywhere. There are many sources that we can tap into. If that is the case, you agree? You are with me? If that is the case, why do we have these disagreements on this? And that is where, you know, this whole thing, you know, for you know, welfare and against welfare. If welfare is common, it exists, all of us need it, all of us use it, 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 it exists everywhere, you know, you can tap into many sources. But why do then we have this disagreement on welfare? It's also part of the human nature. When you're poor, you need welfare. When you're rich, you don't need, you know, you don't want help. Is that? What is that? You have, we have discussed about this beverage report. You know, I think he talks about this. His report is based on what then? How, where is, you know, he talks about this five, five jains or evils or whatever, which state should address if you want to be known as a welfare state. All wants, he's not talking about needs, you know. All ignorance, disease, squalor, idleness, basically health, education, you know. If you have to address these five big things if you want to be known as a welfare state and British or Britain has actually come up with National Health Agency, many, many acts, you know, after 1945. So, his whole argument is based on welfare, needs, wants, or more than that. If you read the report, you will see that, you know. More or less the same things that he, he why people are in need of help, uh, welfare, who are these people who can actually provide welfare. Again, Titmus, uh, London School of Economics, we also discussed about him, who actually took forward the whole social policy as an academic discipline. Okay. We also have discussed this, what is this welfare state or power state or, you know. This is what last week we did, what is welfare state. So what is the, if you put these two definitions together, welfare and welfare state, you see any, any common uh, things there? We just saw welfare definition, right? What is welfare? It is, it is people's needs and beyond. What is welfare state? It is a concept of government, we also discussed last week. A concept of government in which the state plays a key role, number one. How, do, how it plays a key role in protection and promotion of the economic and social well-being of citizens. It's also saying well-being of citizens. Your welfare, in the welfare definition also we saw, it is not just needs, but it's also beyond the needs. It is based on the principles of equality of opportunity, distribution of wealth, public responsibility for those unable to avail themselves of the minimal provisions for a good life. So you see some, something different. Basically, welfare state is nothing but a state which ensures welfare by recognizing that it's just not a need, but it's beyond that. What is social, uh, what social policy is not? You, you heard about that? I think that's very clear. And then he also talks about the two different uh, uh, strands, the ideological uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the empirical traditions. What is that? It talks about two important traditions in social policy. One is the empirical, you know, where he talks about the poor laws and many other, you know, uh, welfare officers and all that, you know. And he also talks about ideological nature. What is, you know, what is your understanding about that? When we are talking about social policy and welfare state, there are these two traditions, you know, you see, you know, 
uh, people either fall into these two categories or two classifications or two, you know, whatever you call it. So one is ideological in nature, like Titmus and others who belong to the left wing, you know, the Labour Party, you know, they came up with this is what social welfare is all about or this is what welfare state is all about, you know. The other people who kind of, you know, came from the much earlier, according to him, is the blue book of the, you know, poor laws, welfare officers, and they say empirical traditions. They have a lot of studies done on poverty, a lot of studies on homelessness, a lot of studies on, you know, a lot of data, and then they say, said something on social policy or welfare state. And he also said there are other arguments like, you know, you are a Marxist or you are an uh, integrationist, you are a socialist, you are a, you know, what is that, liberal, you know. Also, you know, you have your own standpoints, you know, when it comes to social policy and welfare state. So studying social policy, welfare state is not that easy because there are a lot of standpoints, there are a lot of views, there are a lot of arguments as we see in, the, in the, uh, today's class. So I'm not surprised that you're confused, but it, it helps us. I'm confused in a way, that, but when you read more, you apply more, you try to, you know, internalize more, I think uh, it, it will be, uh, uh, it will become clear. I think he also talks about two things, individualism and collectivism. I think that also we can learn a little bit from there, like universality and selectivity, for example. People who believe in individualism, maybe those are the people who are discussing against the welfare or, you know, again, you know, a critique of welfare. Look, they believe in individualism, so they think, you know, you are poor because you are poor, because you are lazy or whatever, you know, very individualistic explanation about poverty. There were others, collectivism, maybe they are more humanity or whatever, you know, we see more fur for welfare that we saw. So maybe these kind of classifications also will help us to further understand what we mean by welfare or welfare state. So there is no one particular definition, there is no one particular, you know, ideology or there is one particular classification. So it's about 50, 60 years, but there's a lot being, you know, published, written, argued, and more recently the comparative nature. You know, they're not talking about uh, uh, redistribution or reformist or liberal, whatever. They're talking about comparison. They're talking about outcomes and achievements. You know, wh what is this social policy achieved in terms of, you know, uh, outcomes, not inputs? So that is where, you know, the comparison come in. That's why I think your course, I'm talking about all this, trying to tell you why comparative social policy is important. It's not just social policy. It's comparative social policy. And why do we need to compare? How do we compare? For that, I think these are the basic, you know, concepts that we need to learn. Okay. That's what I've learned from this video. That's why I wanted to show you this. I hope you enjoyed it. We can see it again and then see what, what he says uh, a social policy analyst life look like, which we have not seen today. Okay. Can we move on now? Till now, what we have done today in this third week, first lecture, welfare, Maybe you now we can see individualism, collectivism, selectivity, universality. You, you understood what is this? Universality, simple. The institutional mechanism or institutional, you know, uh, model talks about universal services. Whether you are poor or rich, the social welfare policies covers all of you, you know. Universal services can reach everyone on the same terms. This is the argument for public services or any other health services extended in 1940s to education and health. The main objection to this universal service is their cost. They say, people say that it's very costly because you have to cover everyone. Whereas the selectivity argument saying that, you know, people who are interested or believe in the residual model, you know, they, they want to select, you know, people who are worth or who are eligible for these services. Selectivity is often presented as being more efficient because you're only giving uh, services to those selected or eligible or, you know, uh, a particular group of people. Less money is being spent. There are problems with selective services, of course. That's what the argument against the selectivity. Because recipients have to be identified, administrative complexities, you know, expensive to run, uh, boundary issues. Okay, this year you, are, you fall under this, but next year you get the job, but you come up, but still your name is still there. You know, all this duplication and replication kind of issues, the boundary issues caused by trying to include some people while excluding others. The selective services also fail to reach some people in dire need. So there is a lot of arguments against 
selectivity and universality. Because these are the another, you know, a concept that help us, whether it is residual welfare or re institutional redistributive, whatever. So, these policies try and, you know, use one of these, you know, in their reach. <clears throat> we have talked about this guy, who actually brought a phenomenal, uh, um, uh, what do you call, uh, differences after, uh, you know, his book on uh, uh, the welfare, the, the three uh, worlds of welfare capitalism where he discussed, you know, the three models using this decommodification index. We also discussed a little bit, but for the benefit of our friends here, decommodification is, a, is, a, is an idea that proposed by, um, what is this guy, uh, Esping Anderson, who is a sociologist from Denmark. He, uh, he still works on different issues. He kind of classified the whole thing into three things. Liberal regimes, he's not saying social policy, but the, uh, the welfare states that fall into this regime, the liberal regime. When we say regime, the set of, you know, uh, principles and ideas, you know, coming together. Social democratic regime and corporatist statist regime or conservative regime, basically. He put all these welfare states into three boxes. That's his contribution. And you can see this book, 1990, the, the, the three worlds of welfare capitalism, a classic. There's a lot of criticism again on this, but then this book has been uh, referred when you start, you know, into this work. His scientific work centers on life course, dynamic, social stratification, comparative social policy. You can see his website, personal website. He basically, decommodification is nothing but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a degree of your reliance on market. That's where we stopped last week. It occurs when a service is rendered as a matter of right. It is your right to get that particular service from the state or non-state actors. Because service can be provided by many, many sources. So it occurs when a service is rendered as a matter of right, you know, a human right. And when a person can maintain a livelihood without reliance on the market. Is that possible in the first place? You know, we need to understand that. Whether you can maintain your livelihood, your well-being or your needs or whatever that we discussed without relying on the market. Mm. So when we say market, what we mean by that? There is a commodity, you know, you're selling and buying. And, and, and for humans, you know, the, the, the major commodity that we have is our labor. And labor is a commodity that you use for which you are being paid and you pay for other services. Basically, that is the, the concept I think uh, uh, here we are discussing. So it occurs when a service is rendered as a human right, not as a, you know, uh, um, something that is given to you but it is your right, but you can maintain your livelihood without relying on the market. So you are decommodifying in the sense, labor is your commodity, but you are not putting your labor or you are not dependent on the market for your livelihood. So you are decommodifying or, you know, so we'll, we'll further see this concept. For example, it's a concept comes from the idea that a market economy, individual persons and their labor are commodified. This is clear, right? There's a market economy, we're all workers, we put our labor as a commodity and we're paying for that, you know? So that is commodification. What is decommodification? There is no need for you to put your labor in the market, but even then you can survive because certain rights are given to you. You are not in the market, you are not depending on the market, but you still survive. How do you survive? The state comes into picture. So you are decommodifying or you're out of the, in this commodity, you know, uh, uh, network or sorry, community function. So as a concept, it comes from the idea that in a market economy, individual people like you and me, we put their labor and which is commodified. Then what happens to people who are not in the market, who are not being employed? What happens to them? And that is where the question is. So it also refers to activities and efforts, generally by the government or the state, that reduce individuals reliance on the market and therefore the labor and, f and their well-being. So decommodification is a strength of social entitlements and citizens' degree of immunization from market dependency. What do we learn from this? You, it is the degree of your immunization, your assistance, your, your individual you know, ability you know, from the market dependency. So how much dependent are we on markets? In Malaysia, for example, or in Singapore, or in Japan, or in Cuba, or in North Korea, for example. 
So how much are we commodified or decommodified? So Anderson's contribution is that all these liberal, social democratic, corporate, statist or conservative, whatever, they show a particular you know, nature when it comes to commodification or decommodification, let's say. We know commodification, right? So for example, let's say what is, uh, 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 in which kind of you know, state or welfare state where the uh, commodification is high. What is a liberal state? What a liberal welfare state? What we mean by liberal welfare state? A liberal welfare state where uh, only a few people, you know, receive services on the basis of the need. It's a residual kind of state. That also we discussed last time. See, liberal welfare state, it's a means tested or a selective. In a liberal state or a residual state, only few people receive services. You know, whether they, and, and before they receive the services, whether they, whether they're eligible or not being decided, they have to fit into some classification and the, the market or, or the state will only come into picture when the family and the market is broken down, you know. So that is the kind of state, welfare state, liberal state. He calls liberal, basically it's a residual state. So according to you, whether the commodification is high or low, in a liberal state, what is the level of commodification? How people, you know, sell their labor? Or you know, what is the dependence on the market? Imagine US is a liberal state or a, you know, or a residual state. Everyone has to work. Only few people receive, you know, a support. And you have to receive support, you need to fulfill certain criteria. And only you will receive this support to a certain time. After that, you have to move on. That is the nature of liberal state or a residual state. In that kind of welfare state, still they're talking about welfare, right? What is the level of commodification? High. The level of decommodification? Hmm? Yeah, it's very low because you, your life is entirely dependent on the market. You are dependent on the market, market services, market forces. So that is what his contribution. Now he has taken this, this classification or regime types he came up with using this concept of decommodification. It's again very well you know, researched in, in labor studies and in, 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 in business, for example. So in liberal states or liberal regime, America, Australia, whatever falls into that, they rely on market, market dependence. Your lives actually, you have to put your labor as a commodity and then you rely on the market, market forces. So the commodification is high and the decommodification is very, very low. Whereas social democratic is an institutional, you know? Everyone receives, everyone receives equal services. There's no selectivity, universal services. It translates into a mix of highly decommodifying because you can live but there are there are, there are classification or there are, there are some, some welfare provisions are attached to your, your uh, services, your performance, the industrial achievement, for example, you know. So all strata are incorporated under one universal insurance system at benefits or graduated according to your accustomed earnings. Yeah, they're all covered in the insurance system, but it also, you know, depends on how much you contribute to a particular insurance system. But, uh, higher the contribution, maybe the higher the insurance services, but all of us are basically co covered. This model constructs an essentially universal solidarity in the favor of welfare state. All of us benefit, all of us are dependent on the state, all are presumably feel obliged to pay, you know, this is a social democratic kind of nature, where you see highly decommodifying, because the, the commodification is, you know, less compared to the compared to the residual or, or the liberal state. So then what do you think about this? The, the third type, the corporate status or they call conservative regime or conservative you know, states, such as Australia or Austria, France, Germany, Italy. The state plays a major significant role, but access to many welfare benefits depends on your employment status and class position. Employment and employment protections are more extensive than in liberal regimes. It's in middle, somewhere in middle. So 
your commodification is not very high, not very less, but it's still there, you know, the, 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 the intermediary level. So this is what he calls a, con a corporate, a statist or conservative regime. I think it's very easy when you see here. Whereas social democratic, they favor universal. The commodification is low. Whereas liberal regimes or residual regimes, they're very selective, high commodification, you know. Whereas corporate or conservative, they're work oriented, individual contributions, again commodification is not very high, but not very low, but in medium levels. This is one way to understand his regime classification. There's another way, I'm going to send you these uh, things, but you can see that. So maybe this is another way, you know, to understand easily. Liberal, Australia, Canada, United States, for example, they believe on classical liberalism, whereas the decommodification is very low, because commodification is high. So let us understand that way, you know. When commodification, when, you know, high, the decommodification is low. So why commodification is high there? Because you can't survive without market resilience. You don't get everything as a right. You know, your services are limited. You only, you know, get selective services. You know, that is the idea there. So the decommodification is very, very low. Whereas corporate or conservative, Austria, France, Germany, where you can see, you know, conservative social policy, the decommodification is moderate in between. Whereas in social democratic, Denmark, Sweden, Holland, all others, the decommodification is very high. You can still live without on the market dependence because you have given certain rights from the state, you know, irrespective of your caste, your class, your gender, whatever. So it is, uh, decommodification is very high. So according to him, this classification also helps us to put these states into, into these boxes. What do you think about this? Hmm? Useful decommodification. Malaysia, where do you think it fits into? Or Japan? Yeah, for example, you're using the same decommodification index and we can calculate GDP and GNP. How do you calculate G decommodification also? You know, there is a procedure we can discuss later and we can put into this. Now, where? Where? Low and liberal, it's a liberal state. Okay. What do you think, uh, Amri? Maybe you have a different opinion? It's, it's, it's there. It's only very few people receive uh, services or certain services are for everyone. For example, basic education is free for everyone here. Right? Basic health is free. So in that sense, it is coming somewhere to social democratic. Whereas certain things, maybe unemployment elements, I don't think you have in Malaysia. What is that you have very selected? Only very few people get that. Maybe, maybe uh, housing or uh, what else? Maybe some, uh, some uh, old age or disability, I don't know. They're very selective. Or what do you think about this? You have anything on this, like your insurance policy? I think you have uh, what do you call economic pensions, EP, yeah. EPF. I think when it comes to EPF, it is somewhere this. Yeah. Huh? Mixed by, we'll see, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Of course, there's a lot of focus on that now, but um, it's changing. You know, maybe 20 years ago it was more social democratic, where everyone receives a lot of help lot of support services, now state is also cutting with the, you know, privatization of health services, privatization of educa higher education. I can see that it is moving somewhere there. But there we can also see these features in, 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 in industries, you know. So it's very difficult, but then it is useful, you know, there is this index. You can also further understand, for example, in a liberal welfare state or liberal ideology, you know, the very need, the basic need is the is the, is the entitlement that you, you based on. It's market dominated, it's residualist, we discussed, corporatist or conservationist. It's the contribution that you make and you get the benefits, the industrial you know, performance achievement there. Whereas state dominated, but still occupational related. Social democratic, it is based on the concept called citizenship, citizenship rights, 
human rights, it's still state dominated but universal. You see the state here, everywhere is there except in that liberal. It's liberal, you have market dominated, whereas social democratic and corporatist is state dominated. Of course, the market also plays an important role. So you see the, 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 the mix of market and state. If the market is high, maybe you know, you, you, you get into that liberal. If the state is you know, playing a dominant role, it could be a conservationist or a corporatist. Corporates, you know, basically the word corporatist is to mention, you know, it is for work related or corporates or industries, occupational related, you know. And social democratic, it's democratic for everyone. It's based on citizenship, state is dominated, it's for everyone. These, these, these typologies help. It's very simple basically. See, we started with two classifications, right? Residual type states and institutional type states. That's the basic, Richard Titmus. But since then, there's a lot of work has been done. You know, there are a lot of uh, scholars, a lot of ideas came in. The, 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 the discipline itself is progressing as an academic discipline, you know, social policy. So a lot of these ideas came in. It, these are very useful. We can see now more actually. So now we see a literature something like this, renegotiating with the welfare state. You know, new welfare state because the, 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 the dynamics are changing. In certain sectors, the state is, you know, acting as if it is the sole, you know, dominant force. Whereas in certain sectors, it is leaving to the market in the same thing. So there's a lot of new things that are happening. So now we see that we need to kind of revise, reinvent the welfare state or redesign, restructure the welfare state we, which we have been discussing in 50s and 60s, 80s. So now we are getting into that. You can also see, you know, in security and welfare regimes. Usually Anderson's work is focused on European, you know, kind of states. Whereas there are African states, Asian states, Latin American states doing very well now, you know, or uh, Eastern Europe. You know, there are a lot of uh, uh, evidences available. So, for example, now people are saying uh, African states, they're very insecure regimes. Still, there's a lot of, you know, governance issues, poverty issues. Whereas in Asian states, they're saying productivist, you know, Amri also said, they're all productivist states, productivist welfare, you know. So these are the new regime types, not just three, but now more. In Latin America, they're calling, you know, semi-informal regimes or something like that. So there are more classification is being added because now we can't fit every country into this, only three. There are more variations now. It's liberal at the same time, you know, a little, you know, a corporatist when it comes. So there are more variations. Now that is where we are trying to achieve, understand. Because after 1990s, we have seen a lot of economic reforms. And maybe I don't need to explain what is economic reforms, this Glo World Bank, globalization, uh, global agreement, uh, trade and tariff, you know, GATT. You know, there's so much happened in the last 30 years. Market-based social insurance, private health care, privatization of education, private pensions, you know, liberalization of the trade, you name anything, I think we can, we can see that after 1990s, including India and many other Asian countries. Introduction of user fees, taxes, war against the very foundations of the welfare state. War, I mean, they said war, but basically, whatever we thought in 1950s, now we are seeing a different trend. You know, user charges, value added taxes, you name anything, we see all of that now were presented and also imposed as solutions to human, social and economic development challenges. So, a lot of reforms that took place. With reforms, good things happen, bad things happen. So, how do we understand welfare state now after 1990s? So, people are saying that it is a mixed economy of welfare. It's not just state dominated or market dominated, but now we see many forces dominating our economy. You agree that? You see that? If yes, the state is not only the provider of welfare, as we discussed, in any country, and the private market does not be able to you know, fulfill all your needs, does not consist the activity for profit only, but a wide range of different motivations, you see them in the private market. That includes NGOs, foundations, civil societies, charities, you know, ventures, social ca you know, uh, capital, you, you, you name anything that is there. 
the state does not operate in isolation anymore. Rather, it acts in conjugation with a number of non-saturated organizations, market, or uh, uh, stock exchanges, or whatever. The state is actively involved in regulation, finance, subsidy, direct provision, as you have seen here. See? You know, except in there, the state is dominated. But now you also see even liberal states like, you know, US, you see a lot of state importance there. So it creates, gave us a mixed welfare kind of economy. So if it is a mixed welfare kind of economy, if the state is not the only force or market is not the only uh, uh, deciding factor, how we understand welfare states. So now we are talking about a different welfare states. We are moving away from residual, institutional, liberal, social democratic, conservation, but we are moving into a different you know, type of welfare state that we will be discussing maybe next week. That's because our economy is you know, changing. So, for example, in a mixed economy, what to produce is being decided by the consumer preferences. Whatever you want, there is research and they produce similar goods. And the partly by the government. The government also you know, decides what to produce. For example, a lot of young people are interested in drugs. So will you be able to produce drugs in Malaysia? No because it's not the priority of the government. But maybe in certain countries it may be allowed to some extent. You know, soft drugs, for example, Netherlands. Maybe you can use, it seems. So in a mixed economy, what to produce, how to produce, for whom to produce is being decided by consumer choices, the government and the market. So you are not alone deciding anymore. So if that is the case, what kind of welfare state are we talking about? Shall we move on? Basically, the point is things are changing. There are economic reforms. There is globalization. All kind of forces are, you know, with the, with the ICTs. Things are changing. Now, in the mixed welfare economy, there are a lot of players. Then how do we, you know, understand uh, the concept of welfare state? <coughs> now, people are saying welfare pluralism. What is pluralism? Because welfare also comes from different sources now. It has long been recognized that social policy extends far beyond the welfare state. That's why each time we discuss social policy, welfare state, there is this connection. Uh, a mixed economy of welfare involving private, voluntary, informal, formal, unions, federations, and all these, you know, creates a different kind of economy and of welfare. So we are talking a different kind of welfare state. Understanding this welfare pluralism is very important for us because it's kind of a movement now, a vital ingredient in the analysis of modern social policy. So the way they used to analyze social policy in 50s may be very different now because that time you are only looking at the state as a major player. But now we are looking state as one of the actors of the whole, you know, uh, 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 actors. So the way we analyze social policy, understand social policy, understand welfare state, the nature of welfare state is very different. It has been progressing. So what we have done in the last two, three weeks is this history. Now why people are doing a particular analysis now, not in 50s, because things are changing now. So we need to kind of, you know, uh, uh, recognize this. That's why you see a different uh, literature coming up now. Understanding the mixed economy of welfare. Look at that, you know, even the statements, even the titles, you know, shows very different from the beginning, the titles that you have seen. The evolution of British welfare state, that is what 50s. Whereas now they are writing, understanding the mixed welfare economy in 2010. I think this book is 2010. You see the, the, the growth in the discipline, the growth in the knowledge, growth in the you know, tools that we have, growth in the understanding that we have. So what we are trying to understand, what all happened in these 50, 60 years, so that we are up to date. Now, uh, a little about, you know, um, uh, organizations like ILO, they're talking about social protection welfare or social protection flow. What is this? You know, again, they're saying that it is a social protection model of welfare state. Not liberal, not residual, not institutional. They're saying social protection model of welfare state. See, there's another idea now, you know, organizations like ILO, you know, promoting this. So this welfare state 
is based on housing, income, support, healthcare, education as main pillars, supported by our citizenship, family, community, you know. That is the kind of thing. Social protection is not delivered only by the state that we agreed. There are many other actors now they're providing. But by a combination of government, independent, voluntary and autonomous public services. So now, we are, when we are talking about welfare state, we are talking about uh, mixed economy, uh, social protection, you know, uh, as, the, as, the, as the main uh, um, uh, vision or goal of the welfare state in 21st century. But is this goal has been achieved or not? Maybe yes, maybe no. Because there is literature that is produced, a critique of this, globalization and welfare state. How uh, a phenomena like globalization or liberalization, whatever, influencing the kind of welfare states that we have. In contemporary globalization welfare state policies, globalization limits the capacity of national states to act for social protection. Because why, why globalization limits? That's what this book by this guy Soderstam and argues. He says that globalization limits the capacity of the national states when it comes to social protection. Global trends have been associated with a strong neoliberal ideology. You know, liberal, the residual ideology. So globalization, there are players, there are winners and there are losers. The losers are more, maybe. You know, that's what his argument is. So as we said, his welfare is for, only for poor, which used to be the major notion, maybe in 50s and 60s. But now I think it's, when we're talking about welfare, welfare state, or, or uh, welfare pluralism, we are talking about everyone. You, me, everyone. No affluent democracy has achieved a relatively low poverty without robust social policy, says David Brady. He's a very young sociologist from US. I think he's been in a lot of committees recently. He also visited UK and he gave this statement. His book on rich democracies, poor people. is very famous. So he says, no affluent democracy has achieved relatively low poverty without robust social policy. That's why, if you remember that, uh, that uh, your, uh, that, that, the video that we have seen, in UK, it has the highest number of children who are miserable, who are not doing very well. Why is that? Supposed to be a very well-developed state, you know? And that's what he was saying, you know? They were very unhappy or more miserable in 1994, 1990s compared to now. So he's requesting the students to look at what made these children to be very miserable that time compared to the children now. What happened? Is it policies? Is it globalization? Is it some other, you know, uh, uh, state? Uh, so basically no affluent democracy has achieved relatively low poverty without robust social policy. Basically saying that you need a robust policy to become an unaffluent democracy, you know, which will actually address, you know, poverty. Basically what he's saying to me is social policy costs, there are costs involved, but you need to invest that money so that you achieve a real democracy so that, you know, the poverty has been addressed. Or a social policy which uses a lot of money, maybe two-thirds of your budget, but it addresses the poverty issues, it addresses the inequality issues, it brings poverty down so that you can actually achieve a, a democracy which is affluent or affluent democracy. So these are some of the arguments that we see in 21st century when we talk about welfare, pluralism. So why do the welfare state exist? This is what the question that we started with today. Why do they exist? Do you think they will exist next century? They do exist maybe in different form. They were existing in 19th century, they exist in 20th century, they are now existing but maybe of the form and the scale and the nature may be different and that's where I think we can, we can contribute. So there are three broad arguments as you can see there in the slide. Yes, welfare states do exist even in 21st century because they provide insurance, they provide fairness, they provide an outcome of a political process in which the median voter has an income below the mean level because the nature of the market distribution of income. So you need to kind of extend your services. They are very just, they are equitable, they are fair. You know, the free market outcomes leads to too much inequality for voters. 
So you need welfare, st you need to have welfare states to fill this gap. So they do exist, maybe we'll cover this next week. So now, if, if that is the case, what's happening in Asian countries? What kind of welfare states do we have in Asian states? Do we have similarities with, uh, can we compare Asian states with uh, uh, Nordic countries, for example, or West, US, UK, or we have something different? That's the, that's the point. So there are, people are saying that this is a fourth type or whatever. We can see a lot of literature coming up in the last 10, 15, 20 years. The East Asian welfare model, the Korea, Japan, and China. You know, what's happening there? What kind of welfare provisions are there? How people are surviving? You know, at the same time, they're you know, taking care of their, you know, family, big families. You know, it's Asian culture is different. Our views about humanity is different. Maybe our religion practices are different. So how in Asia, for example, India, you know, doing very well, even in the crisis, for example, with a huge number of people. There must be something different in these welfare states in Asia. So that is the, an academic interest in, in Asian welfare states. You can see Philippines doing very well, for example. 85% of the population are now members of Philly Health, basically Philippine Health. Uh, uh, universal coverage almost, you know. Can you imagine? It's like NHS and the National Health Services in UK. It costs so much. But the Philippines is able to do that now, you know. The government owned the health insurance compared with 62% in 2010. China, the rural health insurance scheme, is in 2003, they only covered 3%, whereas in now, they're covering 97%. How are they able to do that? China, you know, more than a billion people, one-sixth of the world, you know, it's maybe 10 times bigger than the NHS in UK. How are they able to do that? Skeptical, I'm, I'm, I'm not going there, you know. But at least the figures are, maybe they're not very, you know, well served or the quality of service is bad. Uh, all these arguments, I, I agree with that. But at least, why China should worry, you know, a, a health insurance for all of them, where they were only doing 3% in 2003. How come in 9 years or 10 years, they can cover 97% on paper, even on paper? Why should they do that? Why are they doing that? No, there must be something happening in, in China, you know, maybe democracy waves, maybe, I don't know. So that is what we will be, you know, try and understand what's happening in Asian countries. That is where your comparative social policy in Asia. But we can't cover all 50 countries, but we maybe we'll cover three, four countries. India, for example, look at that, 110 million people, you know, more than twice the number of the, you know, uninsured Americans, you know, Obamacare, whatever. India is also doing a lot of things in, in health. Thailand, for example, universal health care in 2001 introduced pensions for the informal sector. Informal sector. I'm not talking about formal sector. Informal sector. Where there are a lot of migrants, a lot of, uh, you know, illegal, you know, doc, I mean, people with, without documents, you know, work in that sector. So they're also focusing on that. Why are they? The Thailand should be interested in informal sector, you know. Last October, Indonesia's parliament passed a law pledging to provide health insurance uh, to all of the countries, 240 million, health insurance, universal coverage. They're not c talking about selectivity. Do they call, talking about selectivity? No, they're not talking about liberal or residual. They're talking about institutional achievements, you see. The same law also committed the government to extend pensions, death benefits, and worker accidents insurance to the nation by 2015. They achieve or not, it's a different thing but they're aiming to do that. Since they have maybe a better health rates, health, you know, they're talking about, you know, offered cash handouts, like 200 or 500 ringgits now, you know, I think recent government has given. It's a cash handout, you know, for your immediate needs. Disguise tax rebates, people with low incomes and low income, uh, low end rent homes, this year's budget. Korea is introducing an earned income tax credit, a universal basic pension, an insurance scheme providing long-term care for the elderly. So a lot of interesting things are happening. So is this an Asian welfare model? Yes. Asia blue boomed in the complete absence of welfare provisions, maybe uh, 20, 30 years ago. Is that correct? Now, Asian countries or welfare arrangements took a distinctive form, which Ian Holiday of Hong Kong University termed as productivist. We will talk about this, what we mean by productivist, how you maintain productivism with, you know, also care. 
the model subordinated to social policy and economic goals is Asia's Tigris economies or marsupial carrying their dependence along with them they are prowl you know they're prowling they're they're progressing they're jumping they're they're making achievements at the same time they are taking care of their old people children families big families dependents it's not that you're just achieving economic growth but there is also a social development is this possible you know so this is the last slide welfare policies are always controversial as you see in the video also there are different arguments different ideologies different in the conceptualizations over a period of time who gets what and why is the major question for example why the, who gets what what share and why are they getting that is the major question that we need to answer in malaysia answering who leads quickly to debates who is getting what what is chinese getting what is indians getting what is you know malay is getting so it becomes a very sensitive or quickly it gets into debates on class race and what not answering what also leads into you know uh, fiscal arrangements arguments and answering why leads to ideological quarrels why that particular you know race is getting you know whatever benefits what is the what is that they're getting for what cost you know the state is incurring so this who what why you know questions raise a lot of uh, arguments and debates when it comes to social policy in malaysia for that particular matter any other country be that as it may malaysia has always had interventionist governance interventionist governance what is that we'll like, we'll, we'll talk about that and the new disputes are welcomed for highlighting what national building is about this is a penang monthly you know penang institute uh explanation about social policy in malaysia maybe we can also argue on that so basically uh, we will look at more asian uh, economies asian welfare states uh, concepts in asia you know from now onwards and then slowly we'll get into you know health housing employment what do you think three weeks do you think it's difficult it's not difficult just read few papers on this welfare regimes welfare types that's it i think that's basics institutional and residual that's all you know what is welfare state and what is welfare and what is social policy and what is comparative social policy if you understand this much i think this is the grounding we can easily you know do this in the next few weeks it's not difficult just read some papers i'll also send you some easy papers which will be okay